Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to your first, I think your first lecture, is it? Yes. Welcome. And you've discovered one of the reasons why we do all of this IT, it breaks. So, introduction to computer science. What I'm going to, uh, going to be two of us teaching this. I'm going to be teaching you for the Monday session. And a colleague called Amanda Whitbread, uh, Whitbread is going to be teaching you in the other section, which is, I think, Friday. And she is going to be teaching you bits and bytes and technical things. And I will be teaching you how to become really great students. And also going to be covering some things about how to become great employees when you leave here. Well, not actually just then, but also in your second, third year, when you have the opportunity to go out and get a job for a year to learn all about the real world of IT, how it's done, and so on. So, how many are doing computer science? Okay. IT, BSC IT. There should be more than that. Um, nets and security, computer games progra uh, programming, lots of you guys, and computer forensics, and have I left anybody out? <laughs> no, nope. good, seems to got all the programs here. I will be videoing all of these lectures as I have done for the last two or three years and they'll go up on my YouTube channel um, probably Wednesday or Thursday, depending on when I've got time. It takes a little while. I've got quite a lot of uh, videos of lecture sessions, seminar sessions, uh, and so they take a little while to upload and then a little while to process into YouTube. But it means you'll be able to go back and re refresh your memory of what has gone on in these lectures on the Monday that I give you. So, what are we going to do today? Well, I'm going to introduce you to this magical thing. This is your Blackboard, well, your Udo, and then I'll introduce you into Blackboard, which is where all of your course resources and everything else that you need to know actually exists. All the lecture material, all the workshop, tutorial, etc., etc., all come off here. So, one of the things you're going to, all going to be doing tomorrow is coming to see me for an hour in B212, which is one of the big games labs. And I'll show you where the, time to, the um, group allocation is, which I emailed you earlier on, I think last night, or yesterday afternoon, and it says here is a link, or follow the link. That means you've got to go into announcements before you can actually see the link become active. I'll show you how to do that in a minute as well. Now, there are two areas that you're going to find useful. Remember, it says Launchpad here, but this central chunk here is just a moving GIF or something. It's completely useless apart from advertising. So to get to Launchpad, you actually go and click on that little bit there. And the most important part is going to, for you is all of this bit here. Oh, and by the way, if you click on Box of Broadcasts, you have access to the back history of pretty much all of the BBC and other channels, TV programmes for the last many, many years. So if you want to look at something interesting, you've got access through Box of Broadcast once you've logged in here and registered yourself and you can watch back issues of films, particularly interesting documentaries about computer science, um, and all those other things that are really important to give you some interesting background about what's really going on in the field of computer science, IT, and so on. You can get at the library there, you can uh, get at this one, takes you to how to do uh, anti plagiarism, how to avoid the problem of copying, because we don't like you copying without at least you putting a citation. And broadly speaking, in the field of computing, IT, data science, all these other things that you're studying here, there is nothing that has ever been written 
in almost any technical or academic paper that is actually worth quoting. You can refer to it and use the ideas, but there's no point in quoting it because you then still have to use your word count to actually explain what this particular quotation means in the context that you're writing. So why not just write your, that little bit and then put the bracket in the brackets of citation, and we'll talk a lot more about that tomorrow, so that people know where you've got those ideas from. But you can find all the guidance on that bit there. You've got the library catalogue, and we've got huge numbers of books in the library. Did you go on the tour of the library last week? Some of you have, some of you haven't. I still advise you to go have a look around there because there's some interesting resources and lots of spare PCs that you can work on if the ones in our computer labs are busy. And then the mo one of the most important ones you'll want to use is study skills. And you, the ones you really want to look at will be down here. And each of these dark ones here lead you to a separate page, separate sets of activities, guidelines, resources that will help you to understand all of the things that are there. Studying skills, citing and referencing, essay writing, grammar, spelling and punctuation, etc, etc, etc. Really valuable and we'll be starting in there tomorrow during the, at your first workshop with me. Now the other area that you need to get used to is this thing called course resources. Now this is the only time I'm going to be coming in through your picture of how you get into UDOA. Now down here you will find, I mean I've got lots more modules because I'm attached to lots more because I teach first, second, third and master's level so they'll all appear on my list. The one you're looking at here is 4CC509 as you all know. Introduction to Computer Science. And if you go to your announcements, if, you, if we email out an announcement which says there's a link, then you need to come inside Udo, inside Blackboard, and then you see the module link. And that will take you straight to this little bit here. I'll just show you briefly where it is so that you know where it is, so you know when to turn up tomorrow, either in the morning or in the afternoon. And so you'll, I'll just slowly scroll down there. Um, so basically, Computer Forensics Investigation are at 9 o'clock with a couple of three cyber security and about five computer science. Then at 10 o'clock, IT, the BSC IT people, and then you've got Nets and Security and Network Engineering um, is 11 till 12, then we have lunch break. And then it's CGP, Computer Games Programming, and, 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 and then com Computer Games Programming and Computer Science at 3 till 4, and then the rest of Computer Science and one Data Science. Um, from four till, what's that, four till five. So we managed to make it not too difficult, not too late. Uh, originally we were planning to go on until six o'clock, but that's getting a bit late, I guess. However, you do need to turn up for the session that you are booked in there, otherwise you'll run out of space. And because of the way the, these things, when they work, are working, you kind of need to be in the session that you are timetabled into. This module, you don't have a personalised timetable, whereas for every other module you've got this year, as a first year student, you have already got your um, allocated to tutorials, workshops and other sessions um, based on the computer doing it 
for you, or for us, on your behalf. And so you've got to get into the habit of going to where your personalised tutorial or personalised timetable says you're going, and with a modicum of luck, the gadgets on the wall will record your attendance. Uh, you need to ensure that you wave your card on the way in, not the way out, otherwise you'll be recorded as present but late. You've got a window of about 15 minutes from the start time uh, into the lecture for 15 minutes or the workshop session when you're going to be recorded as present and on time. Now I would recommend very, very strongly, as all my colleagues will, that you don't make a habit of arriving at quarter to quarter of an hour late. You'll miss too much. And we will not go back over what you've missed. So use the list, make sure you turn up on time. So what I want to do now is the oh and then you'll find you'll find some detailing staff info about me and about Amanda, particularly um, when she's got I'm not sure whether she's got it. Uh, oh, we haven't done it yet. I'll put mine up there very shortly, and then Amanda will do her thing as well. Study materials. There's three major folders you need to think about. Some interesting resources which we come across where we'll post up interesting links that we've come across or interesting articles that might be of interest to one or more of the programmes represented here. And then <clears throat> you can see the two, sort, two different folders full of my lectures and Amanda's, Amanda Whitbrook, shall I should say. And we'll be populating those, or she will be putting stuff in there week by week. All of my stuff is up there. You can look ahead if you want to. You'll find a link to uh, playlists that shows some of the previous year's lectures that I've given. So you can get a feel for what will happen, but it will change week by week. So don't rely on last year's videos because they will change. I will talk about different things based on what's been happening and other relevant things. But it provides you with a little bit of uh, back, um, back history, a bit of catch up if you need to. Uh, if you've missed something for a good reason, uh, it provides you with a chance to have another look at what we said and remind yourself about it. <clears throat> now, the other thing, backing up your work. One of the perennial questions we get year by year, every other, every year, every module, every semester is, someone comes along a day or so before an assignment is due. Richard, I've had a problem. My memory stick has got eaten by the dog, or I dropped it down the uh, hole in the gutter, or can I have an extension? The answer is no. You need to make sure you back up your work, as you, whether it's your notes, or whether it's your assignments, your code that you're writing for programming one, or whatever, you need to back it up onto the hard drive on your laptop, perhaps, onto the T drive that you can access when you're uh, on the internet, perhaps, or in the labs, the computing labs, the specialist labs, or the U drive via Udo. You might also think about every now and then for really important stuff like your assignments, emailing it to yourself out into Hotmail, Gmail, whatever, because that's not going to get go missing too easily. Spread your backups around, folks. Never let yourself get in a position where your only copy goes missing. So to today, today is basically an introduction to an intro to computer science, and what I want to think about, partly for tomorrow, 
and partly just to get you orientated on my side, on the skills side, the things that will make you a good student, will help you to succeed, to help you to do even better than you thought you could because you've got, I don't know, 250 UCAS points or 300 or whatever, and you think, hang on, I'm not terribly good. Actually, the case is you're all capable of outstanding work. Provided you pick up on some of the things I'm going to take you for, through over the next 12 weeks. You can all do very, very good work. As long as you treat your course here, your work here, as a 40-hour week. Just because you've got four hours or so with or three hours, four hours with me and Amanda, and then you've got equivalent for each of your other three, two modules this term, and that adds up to about 12 hours. Don't assume that you can then go and do other useful things, playing, earning money or whatever, in the rest of those, the hours you've got during the week. <clears throat> if you treat it as a five-day full-time job, and then you've got Saturday and Sunday to do all of those other things, you will succeed. But you do need to put in the hours, guys, of researching, working on the examples, developing for the first half of this semester your article that you're going to write, which I will introduce you to on uh, next week in the workshop. Lots of things you're going to need to spend a lot of time on. So, briefly, I want to think a bit about what you might consider yourselves to be here for and how we look on what you, we expect you to be doing and to start kind of look at what you might expect us to be doing for you or with you. To start with, what do you think I am here for? Am I here to teach you lots of answers or am I here to teach you lots of of questions. Anyone, anybody want to contribute? Pardon? Why do you think we're here to teach you questions? Sorry? Brilliant. That's an incredibly insightful answer. Yes. If I teach you an answer, you stop learning. Now, slightly different perspective on this is that if I think about all of the subjects that you guys are here for, the questions have not changed in 45 years that I've been involved in the world of IT. The questions have fundamentally stayed the same. Whether you, if you look at some of the reading lists that we've got, some of them go back to the beginning of the 20s. Some of the stuff could go back, if I really wanted, back to 1965, 66, 67. And the questions posed in those uh, books and articles are the same ones as we're worrying about today. The answers, however, are very, very different nowadays. Well, some of the time. The technology is changing incredibly fast. Almost on a daily or certainly on a weekly and a monthly basis. One of my colleagues I was talking to at a conference in October last year was complaining that his software that he taught in his class in North America, there was a up, major upgrade to the software pack, package every semester. And this was causing him a lot of trouble in terms of amount of time that he spent learning the new package or the revised package every semester before he felt he was comfortable teaching it. 
But in a different perspective, even if you go and try and do something, say in September 2016, in 10 different companies, the question may be the same, but the answer in every single one of those companies is going to be different because of a different context, different technology that's already there, different people behaviours, all sorts of different things, so that learning the questions becomes much, much more valuable than learning an answer. Because if you have the answer, you know that you can go into ten different companies and tell them the answer. And for nine of them, at least, it will be the wrong answer. It won't be relevant to them at all. And one of the things that businesses keep telling universities around the world is that graduates from most universities with technical programs like IT and computing and computer science, yeah, they're technically capable as is with today's packages, but they're not very good at identifying problems, at identifying questions. And one of the things you're going to be doing with me over the next six, seven weeks is learn how to identify really interesting questions and then coming up with some interesting, perhaps, answers as well. And we'll be doing this with you through the next three years of your academic studies here, leading you to become really good at identifying problems and then working through to come up with the answers. So to do all of that, we ask a little bit of you. Now, I don't know whether you read the small print on those forms you signed at enrolment. Anybody read the small print? No. Why should we? No, we never do. So, a little reminder. You actually signed below some small print that said these things. You agreed to attend all lectures, seminars, <laughs> workshops, tutorials, etc, etc, etc. The things that are on your personalised timetable plus tomorrow. And by the way, all of you except BSCIT have two sessions tomorrow. One for programming one, a workshop in B204 and 204A with people like uh, Dave Voorhees and Chris Windmill who you saw last week at induction. And all of you will come and see me, including BSEIT uh, in B212, for the workshop on ICS. <clears throat> you also, when you signed your enrolment form, agreed that you would prepare as appropriate and as necessary for all seminars, workshops, tutorials, and so on, before you get there. And you also uh, agreed that you would participate in seminars and tutorials and discussions as appropriate. So just a little reminder, that's what you actually signed up to do. So we kind of hold you to that. If you do that, then you're going to be more successful. You will almost, or some of you, certainly those on the BSCIT, which is what I'm heavily involved with, will also have to produce various small presentations for some of your modules. And so you're going to have to play ball with that. Now, don't worry about it. Get nervous if you've never given a presentation. I'm going to be giving you some guidance in a few weeks' time about how to go about sorting out the production of a presentation, as well as how you sort out your ideas so that you can write a great article or a great assignment. Those four commitments which you have signed up to do will actually be required if you want to really understand your subjects of those various programs that you all represent. And you will need to do that if you are going to be able to meet those learning outcomes which you will see in the module specifications for all of the modules you're going to have.
you'll see things called learning outcomes against every module. And there's typically three or four of them. And basically they mean at the end of the module, if you've engaged properly, done all the work, participated as required, then you will be able to do A, B, C, D. I don't know if Dave and Chris mentioned this, but if you miss, if your registration fails three times, or you fail to register three times, or are not there, then there comes a problem. You will be contacted by someone to find out whether you're still interested in carrying on with your degree. If you don't respond, or you carry on not attending, or you've lost your, your card so you can't swipe in regularly, then that's a problem. So you've got to have your card with you and swipe in as often as you can. Otherwise, your registration will be terminated. And intermittently as well as another problem. Any of you who have come into the country on a student visa from overseas, as a, uh, a, not the EU but from overseas, then a very good attendance record is necessary if you are to retain your visa. So if you're not from the UK or, the, or Europe, it is even more important to make sure that you can get registered for every single session that your timetable says you need to attend. What about the sailor? I'll have to get in touch with attendants and say it broke. They probably already know it's broken. But it's a new system and as we all know IT today is not actually terribly reliable. IT today is probably at its least reliable, most fractured, most broken that I have seen in 40 plus years. And that's confirmed by colleagues here and people I've talked to at big international conferences and local UK conferences over the last two or three years. People with more than five years experience are saying, wow, it's getting less and less reliable. Sometimes it works a treat. I mean, today, in magic, I've got a conference I'm going to uh, in late October and got the flights sort of, kind of booked, well, reserved last week on Friday. And this morning, from the travel people downstairs, I get the itinerary and looking at it, they put my uh, BA um, club number in it. And it turns up on my little BA app here perfectly. I go in on, the, on, the, um, the inter on the, my desktop up in the office and have a look at the seats that are allocated to me th to see whether I want to have the ones that automatically got allocated or do I want to change them for something better. Not at the very, very, very front row because that hurts your legs. Bit back, whatever. And all three flights, a BA flight, an American Airlines flight and a BA flight, change to the really nicest seat that I can see there for me. And it works beautifully. And when IT works, it's fabulous. But we all know how often, off the apps here, off that, all sorts of other things, it doesn't always work quite how we expected. Everybody agree with that? On here, I have quite a lot of apps, 22 of which have got updates. And I only cleared those a couple of months ago. Why do I need to have updates every month or two? We shouldn't. However, let's get back on target. Because what we're going to be doing in the assignment starting next Tuesday is to start look, doing some research. Finding an idea that you really connect with. Let's start off with that there. 
I am not here, as you've already agreed, to pour lots of knowledge into your heads. Because it goes in one ear and comes straight out the other ear. Not just with you, but with everybody. So, my role isn't to give you lots and lots of knowledge. My role, and Amanda's, and all of your other lecturers, ultimately, is to get you fired up and enthusiastic about your subject area. That program that you've enrolled on. And each module that you're studying. To find something that connects with you with some of your interests, your specific interests that make you you, that make you wow. And if you can find those wow aspects of each of your modules, each of your programs, then that's where we fired up your enthusiasm. Because ultimately the most important thing you need to learn here is not how to program in Java or how to use Watson Analytics or SAS or all of those magic tools that you're going to learn on computer forensics, investigations or networks from security and management and all those other things. Those are going to change month by month, year by year. What you need to learn is how to find out what these changes are so that you can learn the next version and the version after that. Now, as part of that, there's a very important consequence as how you build that knowledge you've got from your research because of that inspiration that's happened to you. That leads you to lots and lots and lots of interesting sources of information out there in books, on the net, videos, in YouTube and wherever else. And as Philip Pullman said, Read like a butterfly, dotting around, blowing around in the wind, just looking at this flower and that flower and so on. Do that to begin to find all of the information, but for heaven's sake, don't write like that. Write like a bee. Because bees find out in the hive, from the bee dance, exactly where the honey is best. Which flowers are best for the moment? There are workers who go out and explore, and then they fly back in and tell all the rest of the worker bees, if you fly out at this angle, for this distance, then you will come to lots of lovely flowers. And they do it very, very cleverly with a sort of a, a figure of eight dance, and which shows the angle to, that you have to go within a few degrees and the distance by the frequency of vibration of their, back, their abdomen. And so bees going out looking for honey, or foraging for honey, will tend to go from the dance straight to the flowers. And they're incredibly accurate. And then they'll come back the shortest distance. And that's what we need you to do in your writing. Research and read widely, like the butterfly, dotting around, following your nose, following the wind, following wherever. But don't write like that. It's impossible to read and understand. I've kind of shown you the drunken spider's walk or the, the butterfly in red. And you do lots of research like that. You build up your working bibliography like that. As soon as you come to an interesting source, Grab its URL, take a copy if it's a PDF, or use something like uh, that turns a web page into a PDF. Maybe use Cute PDF, which is a printer driver <laughs> that produces um, PDFs. Store those as evidence so you can come back to them. Don't but think about, oh, I don't need to remember it. I can Google it again. It might have gone away. Grab that URL, grab that citation, that reference, put it into your working bibliography, and build that while you're doing that red for exploration. As you do that, build up your ideas about what it is, the problem, 
the definition of the problem, and then the stages of, solu of solving it through to that final little bit at the bottom, uh, right-hand side, conclusion. Don't be tempted to have an open new page in Word or whatever you use, and then put the title, and then uh, writer's block hits you. What you should be doing as you do that red butterfly flight, building up all of those sources of interesting ideas, you start thinking about them and popping all of that in here as well as on your notes. And then you start thinking about, okay, I'm at the start, that's kind of the subject or topic of the assignment. And then you start building the major sections using the H1 header 1 style in Word. And build up the structure from introduction and context, and then the middle part, which is the analysis, and then the last header 1 will be conclusion or something, some words to that effect. Then you think about each of those chapters head, started by the H1 and start thinking, what, about the, what are the stages I've got to go through? And those are the next level, the H2s, the header 2s, subsections. And then you think a bit more about more detail. And maybe you go down to H3, the sub subsections. And then you have a beautiful outline of your article or your assignment, all built up there in, the head, in sort of section headings. And you do that while you're doing the red stuff. Because what it means is when you've now got all that knowledge in your head, you know where you're going, you actually by then have thought so much about the subject, you know what the conclusion is, you've got the steps to go. Then, when you start writing the words that flesh out that assignment, that article, it's ever so simple. Because all you've got to think up is a paragraph or so of words to go for each of those H3 header 3 levels, or maybe two or three paragraphs if you've just got H2 level. Reader's block doesn't happen so much. And kind of in principle, although I'm not going to recommend it to you for your first year, but you might start thinking about it in your second or third year, in principle, as long as you've got that full plan, you could actually write even a three or four thousand word assignment in about four days from that outline. Now, don't do that this year, this semester on this module because you haven't got really that amount of time and you need to practice building your skills to build that structure. And I'll be working with you from next week onwards in the workshops to help you individually in those workshops to start thinking about the topic, the plan, and then developing all of that writing. But this is a really effective way of working. And so have a look at this, have a think about it, think what you did last year while you were doing your A-levels or whatever exams you were doing last year and see whether this is like what you did or whether it's something you need to change towards doing. Because that's what we, a lot of us are doing with our expertise, experience of writing papers and research papers and so on and so forth. And we find it works a treat to do something like this. Whether you use a mind map or whether you use those headers one, two, and three levels in Word or use PowerPoint, doesn't really matter. It's what works for you, whether you do it on paper or electronically. We're all different. We need to find what really works for each of us. So think about that, but separate your research from your writing. If you follow the red line, read a bit, and then you write a bit, read a bit, write a bit, read a bit, write a bit, the chances are you will only know what the conclusion is when you've actually got there. And the steps that go through there are going to be so convoluted and difficult that you will get lost reading it, and 
I'll get lost. I won't know what it is you're trying to achieve. <coughs> and you want to learn to communicate. One of the most critical skills that businesses, amongst other things like problem identification solving, the other area that businesses are really worried about in terms of graduates are, is their ability to tell a coherent story and to communicate effectively. Now, that's going to be a lot of what you're going to be covering uh, over the next 12 weeks with the, these lectures that I give you. You'll also learn a bit about yourself. There, there's a couple of sessions towards the end where you'll be looking very much at yourself individually to find out what you're good at, when, you're, when studying is a good time for you, when you should be writing, when you should research, when you should be experimenting, and so on. You'll be looking at communication with other people, and you'll be learning a lot about yourself as an individual that will help you to make really good choices for your career in the future. It will set you up to decide whether you want to stay on the program you've currently registered on or whether you think you'd like to move to a different one because, hey, actually my skills are over there, my interests are over there, and that's the whole value of what we've got this year. Almost all of you are doing the same modules because that gives you a good chance to understand all the foundations about what computer science is and how it impacts on games programming, net security, forensics, and so on and so forth. And so we get quite a lot of people changing programs at the end of their first year because you're allowed to. And if you look at the things that I'm going to take you through over the next 12 weeks, there will be things that will help you learn enough about yourself to be able to make a sensible decision at the end of next, uh, the 12 months from now when you come back and re-register and decide, yeah, I'm on my computer science, yeah, I'll stay on computer science, or I'll stay on CGP, whatever. Or some of you will say, no, I really want to move from here to there. And we want you to be happy with your choices for next year. Because once you've gone past this time next year, it kind of gets much, much more difficult to change what you're doing. And we'll have a look, as I say, there's quite a lot of stuff about that um, next year, uh, uh, during the next 12 weeks. Right. Just want to. Yeah, we've got time very briefly. <laughs> this isn't the current. Um, <coughs> module handbook, because Amanda's sorting this year's out, but this is last year's, and the bits I want to take you through is this bit, which isn't changing. There are various bits that are changing, but not this bit. What we're trying to give you as an introduction this, this semester with this module is to help you to understand some of the fa foundations of bits and pieces of computing, um, the technicalities, and also how to do the academic stuff. So your two main learning outcomes, and they're tested with two different types of uh, tests, are the knowledge of the history underlying concepts and principles of computer science. You might call it the bits and bytes. General facts about computing, about the architecture of computers, and some of the fundamental theoretical foundations that help you to understand what it's all about. And then the second, and that's tested with a computer-based test in January. And there'll be, on the exam's uh, timetable, you'll find the... Um, a line for 4CC509, and I'm not quite sure which day it's going to be. We'll find out 
towards the end of the term when exam, exams or uh, department have done all the scheduling. <coughs> and you'll go into the labs up on B2, the specialist labs, and they'll be set up and you'll have about an hour to answer a number of questions. The second learning outcome is where you can demonstrate an ability to find, evaluate, interpret quantitative, qualitative data uh, in order to develop and present lines of argument in an appropriately academic fashion. And that is an, an article, a three-page article you're going to write for me by week seven or thereabouts. And then, if I can find, if someone would like to volunteer all the articles which achieve 60% or better, which is a 2-1 or better, if someone would like to volunteer or a group of people would like to volunteer to edit them into an e-publication, then we'll be able to post that up on our uh, publications or website that everybody can see, your parents and so on, your friends who you want to see, or potential employers will be able to see it there as well. It'll be about three pages, it'll be three pages plus or minus a bit in a standard called Springer LMCS. We'll give you the um, template and then you will use it and you will have four different topics that you'll be able to choose from. And, have, and they are big, big topics and you will look at the topics. You might want to choose a topic that's related to your program or you might want to choose a topic which is more related to your interests. And then you will choose, do some research and narrow it down to something that you can write three pages about using this format. More next week. The other one, as I said, is a computer-based test. Now, we've got some thoughts on a couple of books that you might like to have. One is The Com Hidden Language of Computer Hardware and Software. That might change. I'm not sure what Amanda's planning on doing. This is the one they used last year. But the one that I'm really keen that you should be thinking about is this one. Stella Cottrell's book, Critical Thinking Skills. <laughs> it's quite cheap. You can get it downstairs in the bookshop, if you want your own copy, there's lots of copies up in the library. And it tells you a little bit and helps you to develop the ability to do this thing called critical thinking. Something that is absolutely fundamental for getting a good job. Another of those skills that uh, employers keep complaining that we don't develop effectively. Or at least you guys don't learn effectively. I'm never quite sure which way around it is. However, to get through your three years, you really need to get to grips with this idea of critical thinking. Kind of thinking logically and comparing and contrasting more than one idea. It means that to think critically and to compare two ideas, you've actually got to put your information into your head. This means that you don't just scan something when you found it on the screen and think, oh, that's interesting, but I don't need to remember because I can always Google it again. Because if you work that way and don't put anything into your long-term memory, all you will have will be the latest things that you read. And it's very difficult, if you haven't got it memorised or put into your memory somehow, to be able to think about two different things, let alone three or four things, which is where critical thinking really comes into play. So you need to break the habits that many, many millennials like you guys appear to have got into according to all the research, that you scan very quickly and move on to the next thing and you know you don't have to remember because I'll Google it again. All that happens then is it goes into short-term memory and gets displaced five minutes later with the next thing you read. So find ways 
of actually reading thoroughly and effectively. Build it into your memory while you're doing that red butterfly uh, dance around the countryside, around all of your sources. Make the notes about what it is that they're all about. Make, ensure that you actually record where you found all of your ideas. Because if you don't have a reference to it, you can't use that idea. And I learned this the hard way when I was doing my LLM back around 2001 and 2. And I came across something really, really interesting that a year later I wanted to use in one of my assignments. I didn't have a copy of it. I hadn't taken a PDF of it. I hadn't got the URL of that particular page. When I wanted to use it, the website that I got it from had been cleaned up carefully because it was really quite a difficult information for the person had written about. And could have opened him up to some really rather nasty uh, charges on, in international law. It had gone when I wanted to use it. I didn't have the URL, I didn't have a citation, a reference, didn't have a PDF. So I had to find a completely different approach to that assignment because I'd lost the pointers to the information and it had been very wisely tidied away. So if you find something interesting, grab it, get its reference, put it in a, on a document or in one of these automatic bibliographic uh, engines that you can use. Really don't mind how you do it. Whatever works for you is the way to do it. But don't lose those pointers to interesting information you find when you're doing your red walk. Because otherwise you won't be able to do the critical thinking. And I want you to start developing critical thinking now. In other programs, in other parts of the university, in other universities, first year is, oh, describe and understand. I want you to make a jump ahead of that. To critical thinking now. Finding sources, comparing and contrasting, developing a logical analysis and coming up with your own justified answer. Because that's what we're going to be testing you on in this assignment. And that will then put you way ahead of many of your colleagues. It will help you to become much more effective in your studies and your assessments over the next year and a half. You can actually do it, it turns out. You may not think you can today, but by the time I finish with you and you've engaged in this for the next 12 weeks, you will discover that yes, you can. Thank you and I'll see you all tomorrow. <laughs>